Maybe it was that cookie wrapper you threw away last year, that plastic soft drink bottle from last week, or that chippy bag from yesterday. Chances are, you've probably never given that piece of plastic a second thought. But let me ask you, how do you feel knowing that piece of plastic will certainly outlive you, your children, and even five generations down the line, likely harming several innocent organisms in the process? It's undeniable that we've become so accustomed to plastics in our everyday lives for all the purposes it fulfills, so much so that it has literally integrated itself into our society. Our own bodies now contain plastic waste. And that's the thing. Plastic is cheap, easy to produce, and is fit for many purposes, at least until those purposes are complete. We love plastic for the convenience it brings us, and that's not the problem. It's the plastic waste we're left with once we're done. Now, how many times have you seen images of whales engulfed in plastic, turtles stuck in plastic bearings? This is abhorrent and an issue that is truly prevalent in New Zealand. Now, the time has finally come where we've actually recognised the impact that plastics have on our environment, and these solutions are our attempt at trying to resolve this issue. But they all have one major flaw. While they contribute to reducing the amount of new plastic we add to the environment, they don't really do anything about the plethora of plastic that is already out there, the 252,000 tonnes on average that we've discarded each year. Now, when you recycle, you probably think you're doing a good deed, right? But the thing is, most people don't know that of the seven types of plastics, only plastics types one and two are easily recycled in New Zealand. And more over that, in total, we only recycle 28% of our plastics, meaning that 181,000 tonnes of our plastics go straight to the landfill each year. This is due to several factors, but first of all, the first factor is that plastics have to be thoroughly cleaned before they're able to be recycled. But the truth is, almost all plastic is contaminated with food and liquids alike when we throw them in the rubbish bin. So they either have to be cleaned at the recycling station, which results in a waste of water, or it's simply just easier to throw them in the landfill. Therefore, we've been brought up with these issues, and therefore we need to look for a better one. Furthermore, New Zealand may seem small in terms of our plastic pollution, but in reality, per capita, we are one of the worst countries in the developed world for plastic waste. And as highlighted in the media, with China and other foreign countries refusing to take in our plastic waste, which we've been so heavily dependent on in the past, this raises the question of what is the solution to our plastic crisis? Mycoremediation. While a relatively new form of bioremediation, which is a process of removing pollutants using naturally occurring organisms, the potential of this technology to greatly remove our plastic waste is extraordinary. And what does this involve, you might ask? The simple yet effective use of fungi. Now, endophytic here means a characteristic of something being able to grow within plants. And luckily for us, there are an abundance of endophytic fungi. With as many as 3.8 million endophytic fungi species, which are adapted to thriving on and off land and in differing saline and environmental conditions, this means that fungi are highly versatile and therefore are a sustainable approach to reducing plastic. Plastics are polymers. So polymers are long chains of repeating molecules that have very strong intermolecular forces of attraction. Intermolecular here means between the molecules. These strong forces of attraction explains why these plastics are so hard to break down, because a lot of energy is required to break these bonds. And therefore, they persist in the environment for hundreds, even thousands of years without breaking down into non-toxic monomers. Let's take polyethylene, for example, a very common plastic in the, polymers, in the polymer industry, seen in plastic bottles and, yes, the infamous plastic bag. These monomers, ethylene, are made up of two carbons held together in a strong covalent bond. In the manufacturing process, this double bond is broken so that it's allowed to join up with other monomers in a long polymer chain to form polyethylene. So what makes fungi unique to solving our plastics problem comes from the mycelium. The mycelium is the vegetative part of a fungus and are made up of branched thread-like structures called hyphae, which are comprised throughout its structure. So fungi break down plastic with using mycelium in a simple process. Firstly, the hyphae secrete enzymes, which chemicals that speed up a reaction 
onto the pollutants, plastics, which then breaks it down into monomers, the smaller non-toxic units. So essentially, this process reverses the plastic back to non-toxic molecules. And then after this, the fungi then feed on the monomers and are able to absorb these monomers. And then if we want, the, monomers are, um, the fungi are perfectly safe for human consumption, if you're up for that, of course. And another issue, though, are microplastics. So large pieces of plastic debris, which have been broken down to stream, extremely small particles, become microplastics, which some we cannot even see with the human eye, and they even manage to evade the extensive filtration systems in our water. Therefore, microplastics are extremely toxic. And the thing is, because they're so small, they can't be recycled. There's no other way for us to get rid of them. With microremediation, we could, target these, we could target these microplastics, as a study by the University of Aveiro showed that in only seven days, in ocean water, this fungi broke down 77% of a microplastics sample. And if you're still not convinced that fungi are suitable to break down plastics, in a study conducted by the American Microbiology Society for Journals, they published a study which showed that the fungi Pestilitiopsis microspora in just two weeks cleared almost 100% of a plastic sample in anaerobic conditions, meaning it did not need oxygen. So by now you're probably wondering how to envision fungi being applied for this purpose in New Zealand. Well, first of all, this is a plenitude of ways this could be executed. We could have various fungi treatment stations along coasts, rivers and estuaries, for example, where which would cultivate and control fungi, for example, where plastic would wash in and from other sources or even that's manually deposited and it would be able to break it down. And as for landfills, fungi are unique in that since they have that anaerobic property, they would be able to target plastic that's buried deep within these piles or at the bottom, which are often deprived of oxygen and that we would have not been able to get rid of otherwise without burning the plastic and releasing copious amounts of carbon dioxide gas. So the benefits of microremediation are extensive. First of all, environmentally, fungi clearly have the potential to clean up our environments and waterways. This consolidates the New Zealand government's goal for a cleaner, greener environment. However, fungi can possibly be harmful as they act as parasites and pathogens but by keeping them in an isolated, controlled environment with plastic waste and typically inorganic, non-living compounds, the, plastic, the fungi wouldn't have the potential to go and harm, severely harm other organisms. And perhaps the most obvious benefit is that there'd be an increased livelihood of marine life and other organisms from less plastic waste harming these animals. Microplastics can be found in almost all marine life, which when we consume, disrupts our normal bodily hormone functions even contributing to weight gain. It's consistent with a study from Columbia University, by implementing microremediation and decreasing the amount of microplastics in our water and food, we would therefore decrease risk of obesity and cardiovascular diseases. But however, on the other side, there could possibly be a stigma of exploiting fungi to solve a man-made issue such as our plastics pollution. But this is a compromise that would need to be made in order to attain the benefits of fungi and one that would be easily overlooked. Now finally, economically, it's important to note that recently the value of plastics has dramatically decreased and countries have refused to take in our plastic waste. Therefore, the government in press releases has stated the need to find alternative countries to export to or even just to fund recycling schemes in New Zealand to try and get rid of our surmounting plastic waste. But we would be able to save money with micro-remediation because it's far more sustainable in the future since only 0.006 tonnes of fungi is needed to remove one tonne of plastic from our environment. And overall, as for the 252,000 tonnes of plastic that we discard each year, from this, we'd only need 1,512 tonnes of fungi to remove this plastic waste. Now, of course, initially, fungi would be really expensive because it's a new concept and, of course, we may not have all the resources here in New Zealand. However, over time, the money saved from using this micromediation process instead of recycling, which is a high ongoing cost, we would be able to save money over time and therefore surpass this. Because the status quo is currently $26 million. And for us to each year to use fungi to completely wipe out our plastic waste, it would only cost $7 million. So the status quo is almost four times as much. And therefore, clearly, micromediation is much more favorable. 
So in conclusion, I've illustrated the evident need for fungi to clean up our environment through the process of micromediation. This method is simple and brings about tangible benefits to New Zealand because fungi have already demonstrated the potency to effectively and widely diminish plastic waste. Reducing our plastic use and recycling is not enough. If we really want to salvage New Zealand's reputation as being clean and green, then we really need to look to fungi for the future. Thank you. Kia Callan. Hello. Um, if the fungi can do this to plastic, why isn't it doing it now? Um, the thing is that we're not allowing a fungi to target plastic in the natural environment because we haven't looked at this issue and because it's... We're not stopping it though, are we? Pardon? We're not stopping the fungi doing it to plastic. Um, what's no, what's just, the barrier? They're just not in the right conditions and they're not in the right places to be able to effectively diminish plastic because they're often in tropical or wild scenarios where we often don't really place our plastic. So we just haven't seen the potential yet. And are there, are there particular species of fungi that would do this to plastic? Um, yes, yeah, so there's 3.8 million species, and between in those different species, there's different properties that allow them to, uh, first of all, be, um, survive in ocean water, ones that are anaerobic, and of course, so there's, essentially there's probably a fungi for every single climate or biome on the earth. And if you're using it to clean up waterways, how would you control it? So if you have these fungi recycling stations, you'd allow the water to, fl um, to flood through, and then you'd use micron filters so that fungi wouldn't escape from the stations, and allowing the fungi not to flow into the water, so therefore they wouldn't have the potential to harm the environment or flow through the water to our drinking sources, for example. And is it your understanding that the fungi would break the polymer down to monomers or yep. just smaller polymers? No, um, well, the fungi break it down into monomers because intermolecular forces are broken. So therefore they're non-toxic. But if they were just broken down into smaller polymers, that's what recycling and other, other things are doing right now, which become microplastics and are therefore still toxic. And do you imagine that the fungi would just be introduced to the rubbish dump? Um, I think possibly it would possibly more control than just throwing the fungi into the rubbish dumps. But, I mean, um, we would be able to set up stations on land as well and then just have rubbish disposals coming into these stations so it's all controlled and maintained. Because there would be greenhouse gases released in this process, I'm imagining. Um, yes, but the thing is with fungi... Um, instead, instead of releasing carbon dioxide, they actually absorb it. And so we wouldn't generate greenhouse gases because if we had more fungi, more greenhouse gases would go into the fungi, which then goes into the soil. So therefore, we're actually making the environment cleaner. And are you anticipating the need to genetically modify the fungi for these purposes? Um, I haven't looked at that. However, I think that as they are, they are okay. But possibly in the future, if we wanted to optimise performance from the fungi, that's something you might need to look at. Thank you. Cool.